Well, good morning, church. As you can see, we're doing church a little bit differently this morning. And no matter where you're watching from, I just want to invite you to enter into a time of worship as we sing a song to our Lord together this morning. And before we do that, I want to share a couple verses with you that hopefully encourage your heart. I know during this time we look around and people are fearful, there's panic, and it's just a time of uncertainty. And so I want to read these two verses before we sing this song together. The first one is out of Psalm 55, verse 22, and it says this, Cast your cares on the Lord, and He will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. And the second one is out of 1 Peter 5, 7. This says, Cast all your anxiety on Him, because He cares for you. And as we sing this song, we're going to be looking, fixing our eyes on Jesus and looking up, declaring that, Lord, there's no one above you, and we can cast all of our cares on Him, let our worries be let go at the foot of the cross, and just let His peace fill our hearts. And He's worthy to be worshipped this morning. So let's sing this together. Tell you 
prayer is that you would fill us with your courage, that we would be confident in following you, God, and believing that you are sovereign, that you are in control, and that when the earth quakes, God, that you're the one that holds its pillars firm. We wanna be a light in our city during this time, Lord. I pray that the church would be a calming presence in the midst of chaos. Lord, that you would use this time to reveal who you are, God, that people would be drawn to you that don't know you, that they would put their trust in you and see the reason for our hope. We love you, we worship you this morning, and in your name we pray, amen. As Eric said, good morning. We're so glad to have you with us here this morning. It's a little bit different. As we know, we're all having to adapt to these new changes, but we're so happy that you have tuned in and joined us online here this morning. Um, We know that the current situation has had an effect on all of us, whether uh, you're in a situation with health conditions where you're not able to leave home right now. Um, Maybe you've actually lost a job in the past week. We know there's a number of you who are in that situation. Or maybe you're just learning how to homeschool for the first time. Uh, We're all having to adapt and figure out new ways to do things. But the important thing is, um, that being said, we would love to hear from you. Um, We're trying to do our best to stay connected, and so we would love to hear from you. You can still call in at this time. You can send in an email, uh, communicate with us via our social media platforms, Instagram or Facebook, or even on the chat uh, sections to the side of this feed as well. But please let us know how you're doing and how we can be praying for you. Uh, Just a couple things we want to mention this morning before Pastor Ken comes up. Uh, First of all, last week we heard that some of you were having some difficulty with the online giving platform. Again, we do want to encourage you, if you're able to continue to support the ministry, here, uh, please do so as we depend upon your generosity. Uh, But we know that sometimes new things can be confusing. And so our team here has produced actually a tutorial video that will walk you through step by step on how you can actually set up your account and actually give online. And so that link to that video is also going to be posted over on the comments section, uh, just to the side of this video. So be sure and check that out when you can. Um, Other than that, I just want to let you know during this time, we've changed a lot of different things. And rather than you have to to be following several different uh, venues or platforms to find out the new information and content that is putting, being put out there. Uh, we wanted to be put it in one spot for all of you. And so starting now, you can just go to calvaryspokane.com, just scroll through that front page there, and you can see just a listing of all the different things. We're trying to provide as many different resources as we can. Some of you have already seen the daily encouragement uh, that's been going out, the videos by uh, Pastor Ken and Pastor Drew and Eric as well as some other resources. You can submit your prayer requests. Know that we are praying for you. If you'd like to receive the prayer report so you can pray for others, you can do that there as well. But again, all of those resources are there to encourage you and support you and really, really help you during this time. And you can find all of those at calvaryspokane.com. But again, uh, Pastor Ken is here with us to continue his series on what's the world coming to. So uh, Pastor Ken. Good morning, and thank you, James, for that information. Uh, We're going to continue this morning in our series dealing with the end times, a series I've called What's the World Coming To? And this is the ninth installment in this series, and today I want to talk about a topic that is um, both challenging and fascinating. It's called about the Battle of Gog and Magog that's spoken of in detail in Ezekiel 38 and 39. It's interesting because people often ask me, do I think the coronavirus is a sign of the end times? And frankly, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's uh, too early on and we'll have to see how long the effects are. But the reality is there are certain biblical signposts and that's what we've been looking at. Things that are clearly stated in the scripture because pandemics or pestilence, as the Bible refers to them, are things that have come in and out of human society throughout history. But in terms of things we're looking at, and particularly today, these are unique one-off things that are clear indicators that we're living in what the Bible calls the last times. So I want to begin by reading a portion of the passage in chapter 38 of Ezekiel, and I want to read the first nine verses. And the text begins this way. It says, the word of the Lord came to me. That's the prophet speaking. And the Lord said, Son of man, set your face against Gog and the land of Magog. 
the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn you around and put hooks in your jaws and bring you out with your whole army, your horses, your horsemen, um, fully armed and a great horde with a large and small shields, all of them brandishing their swords. Persia, Cush, and Put will be with them, all with shields and helmets, and also Gomer with all of its troops, and Beth Togarma from the far north with all of its troops, and many nations with you. Get ready, be prepared, you and all of the hordes gathered about you, and take command of them. And after many days, you will be called to arms. In future years, you will invade a land that has recovered from war, whose people were gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They had brought, been brought out from the nations, and now all of them live in safety. You and all of your troops and the many nations that you will go up with, advancing like a storm, you will be like a cloud covering the land. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, I ask that as uh, I attempt to really outline this account that's covered, not just in what we've read, but in many more verses in chapter 38 and 39, I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would give us a perspective, that we can see these things with a clarity and give them a proper understanding and application to our lives. We know, need to know, Lord, especially in times like this, that you are the God who not only foresees the future, but you control it. And that as we go through this season that we're in, you're still on the throne. You're still ruling over the affairs, not of just nations, but over us as individuals. And help us to rest in that confidence, Lord, as we see the surety of your true word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, over the last few weeks, we've been looking at what I've termed prophetic signposts. And these are those indicators that tell us that we're living in what the Bible calls the last days. And the last days has actually a very specific application. It refers to a period of time that will precede and lead up to Christ's second coming. So it's not just one day, but it's talking about literally a period of time or a season that, of change within the world's events. And we talked about last week how Jesus said that uh, Jerusalem would lie in destruction until uh, it was uh, the time of the Gentiles had been fulfilled. And so we're talking about this period of time following what we described last week as the time of the Gentiles. Now, the heart of these prophecies, as I talked about last week, is both the rebirth of the nation of Israel and the follow, what followed that was the reestablishment of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. And this, again, was in fulfillment of multiple prophecies and promises that were made by God to Israel. For example, in chapter 36 of Ezekiel, he says, I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. So here was a promise by God, again through to Ezekiel, that God would regather his people and reassettle them in the land of Israel. Now, the promise was considered for a very long time, especially after the Babylonian, or excuse me, especially after the uh, Roman destruction of Jerusalem, it was considered by many people to be simply in a possibility. I mean, many experts came to view this as kind of an allegorical statement, certainly something we shouldn't think of as being fulfilled in a literal sense in the real world. But to them, the rebirth of Israel was as unlikely as a laboratory skeleton suddenly coming back to life which is actually pretty close to what Ezekiel tells us in chapter 37, because there the Lord gave him another prophecy. And he said, the hand of the Lord is upon me, and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord, and the Lord set me in the middle of a valley. Uh, it was full of bones, bones that were very dry. And he asked me, son of man, can these bones live? Now, normally, we would look at a valley of dry, desiccated bones scattered all around, no flesh, no muscle, no sinew, and somebody were to, if God were to ask us or anybody were to ask us, can these bones live, our normal response would be, of course not. 
And yet Ezekiel knew that he wasn't dealing with anything that was normal, that God was showing him something that was supernatural. And he looked to God and he says, Lord, only you know whether they can live. In other words, it would be only a miracle of God that could bring these bones back to life. Importantly, the picture that Ezekiel is drawing is of a nation that is so beyond restoration that they're really equivalent to a mass of dry, lifeless, desiccated bones spread across a large, barren valley. Would one day be suddenly that they would come to life would be so inexplicable, so miraculous, and so impossible that in particularly that they would even flourish as they're described in this prophecy would seem just as something pretty ridiculous or else something again that was not supposed to be taken literally. Well, today we can look back on the miracle of the rebirth of the nation of Israel, which happened in 1948, and it's easy for us to forget that this was an impossibility. When Isaiah foretold that the nation was going to be born in a day in chapter 66 of his prophecy, again, most people thought, well, that's just talking in allegorical or metaphorical terms. For a nation that was extinct as a brontosaurus to one day be resurrected and become a nation, especially after 900 years of being occupied by a series of different kingdoms and empires and nations. Well, we would just simply say, that's not something that's going to happen. But as the Lord had promised them, again in Isaiah 51, he said, the Lord will surely comfort Zion and will look with compassion on all of her ruins, and he will make her deserts like Eden and her wasteland like the garden of the Lord. So as we talked about last week, how amazing it is that, as Isaiah said, the desert would blossom, and today we know that Israel plants all sorts of agricultural things in the desert by simply using some of the most sophisticated and advanced forms of irrigation, which many of us actually take advantage of in our own homes and yards today. But equally impossible was the promise that he would restore Jerusalem as Israel's capital city. I mean, such an event would also necessarily be an amazing thing, and yet God said it's something that's necessary for the fulfillment of his plan to bring redemption, not only to the world as a whole, but particularly to the Jewish people. So that Paul prophetically foretold us in Romans chapter 11, he said, did God reject his people? That's an interesting question. Usually in the New Testament, when a question is asked, we call it a rhetorical question, which always implies the answer is no. And so he's essentially saying, did God reject his people? The answer is no, of course not. In fact, he goes on to say, by no means, or literally, God forbid such a thing. It's completely unthinkable that he would forsake his people. Now, the reason why I emphasize that is because many people for a very long time say and still say that Israel today is not God's chosen people. They're just a nation of people that live in the Middle East, has no relationship to the biblical prophecies. But one of the things I hope to establish today is that that's a mistaken conclusion, that in fact, they are the people whom God has regathered into the land to fulfill his ultimate plan and purpose. He goes on, Paul that is, goes on to say in chapter 11 of Romans, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery. So he's saying when we look at Israel, we're looking at something that is a mystery so that you may not be conceited. In other words, to think of ourselves as being better than the Jews or more important to God than the Jewish nation is. And then he continues, Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved. Here again, we have the second reference to the time of the Gentiles. Paul, Jesus made that statement in Matthew 24, but now here we have it again stated by Paul, that in the end, he says, most importantly, all Israel will be saved. This, of course, implies that the Israel that's in the land at that time is not saved, which is exactly the condition they find themselves in today. 
Yet God goes on to reveal to Ezekiel that the second time when he would regather them and bring them back to the land after the Roman conquest and the, and the scattering, what they call the diaspora, the dispersion of the Jews around the world, that after the second time, he's going to restore them and regather them. But he says in Ezekiel 36, 22, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, and when I show myself holy through you before their eyes. And so it's really important to understand what he's saying here, because going back to Leviticus, when he said, I will send you into captivity if you don't follow my laws, he said, but if you repent, then I'll restore you. And many people, again, argue today, well, the Jews there aren't in repentance. In fact, 90% of people who live in Israel, especially the Jewish community, uh, are what we call non-observant Jews. I mean, they don't really follow the Mosaic law or try to keep it in any significant regard. But what he's telling us here is that the second time he's going to bring them into the land, it's not because they have repented, but rather he's doing it for his own sake to finish the work that he began with them. The ultimate goal, in other words, of this regathering is to bring all people, Jews and Gentiles, into a saving faith. But that work of salvation will involve two things, judgment of sin and also salvation for those who are humble and repentant. This is why whenever we talk about the last days, it's necessary to speak about Israel and Jerusalem because they are essentially what we would call ground zero for God's final work of redemption and judgment upon the planet. In fact, the book of Revelation reveals that it's from Jerusalem that we'll find the Antichrist sets up his kingdom and reigns over the world. We'll find that a third temple will be built there by the Jews during the tribulation period, and also that the abomination of desolation, which is the decision by the Antichrist to put his image in the temple and command people to worship him as God instead of the God of Israel, that that's all going to take place in Jerusalem. It's also in Jerusalem when Jesus returns, that he will set his foot upon the Mount of Olives and establish at his second coming his millennial kingdom that will reign over the earth for a thousand years. And then also we read the last chapters, last nine chapters of Ezekiel, where he describes what we call Ezekiel's temple, the millennial temple that will be there upon the earth during those thousand years of Christ's reign. Of course, Ezekiel is not the only prophet who foretold these things and spoke about the importance of Jerusalem and Israel in terms of the last day plan of God. The prophet Zechariah did as well because through him he foretold us that Israel and Jerusalem would be a problem, if I can use this term, of biblical proportions. In other words, it's going to be a major problem in the midst of the nations of the earth. He says in chapter 12 of Zechariah, beginning in verse 2, he says, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness and trembling that sends all surrounding peoples reeling. So he's very, he says Israel and Jerusalem are going to be very troubling, a, a, a problem that's perplexing. Nobody can figure out how to solve it. He goes on, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock, which literally means a rock that's so heavy and so burdensome that it's impossible to be moved. He says, I will make it immovable for all nations. In other words, if all the nations of the world worked together to remove Jerusalem from the heart of Israel, they would not succeed, which is interesting because there are many who are do, trying to do that very thing at this time. And he goes on, all who try to move her will injure themselves and Jerusalem will remain intact in her place. Once again, what makes this prophecy so incredible is that Jerusalem uh, is not in and of itself a very important place. Now, before you begin to react, let me explain why I say that. By international standards, in other words, looking at it from a horizontal perspective, from a human perspective, Jerusalem is basically a fairly small city. It's got a population of a million people. And there are many, many cities that are much larger. It, it's right in the midst of a very small country, and it's surrounded by a, a, a handful of insignificant third world countries that basically look like impoverished zones by comparison. 
Yet for 3,000 years, we find that Jerusalem has been kind of a nexus point for international conflict. And which is interesting because she has no real strategic importance. I mean, you don't find that Jerusalem is on the highway to any place that anybody really wants to go. It's not like it's a destination point from people around the world other than religious pilgrims. And also, it up until recently, has not had any significant resources that anybody could covet or want to take possession of. And yet we find that one of the things that defines this city is military conflicts. For, for 3,000 years, they've had war after war and conflict after conflict. I mean, there is no other city in, in, in all other city in the history of the world that has faced so much warfare as Jerusalem. It has been attacked some 52 times. It's been besieged 23 times. It's been captured 44 times. And it's been completely destroyed twice. And which is, uh, there is no parallel. You can't find another city on the planet that has that kind of history behind it. Secondly, it's a place of religious conflict and has been for a very long time. It's the only city that is claimed by all three of the major religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, as being their significant holy site upon the planet. And so as a result, you have this constant religious tension going on between these different religious groups. And we have to ask the question, why is it? Why is it such a hot spot? And the answer in part may be supplied by Scripture. It's the only city which God said when Solomon first built the first temple in Jerusalem. It's the only city that he said, I have consecrated. And to consecrate something means that you declare it to be a sacred, holy place. There's no other place on the planet that God said, I am consecrating, consecrating the city of Jerusalem and particularly the Temple Mount as my holy place. A place where he says, I will put my name there forever. We talked about that last week. But also he says, my eyes and my heart will always be there. So it has this unique uh, aspect. I mean, understandably, God who is omnipresent is everywhere and sees everything all the time. But he's trying to put it in anthropomorphic terms or human terms that we would understand. He says, when it comes to where I focus my attention and I orchestrate world events, Jerusalem is ground zero. It's the place where I focus. And that's why even Zechariah would add in the second chapter of his prophecy, he says, whoever touches you, speaking about Jerusalem, touches the apple of my eye. Now, the apple of your eye is that, that most vulnerable part of your eye, the cornea of your eye. And he says, if you touch that, then you react automatically because it's a, a very painful and threatening thing to do to a person. And God says, that's how I view Jerusalem. You touch her, you'll pay the consequences. This, I think, explains why Israel and Jerusalem continue to be the most consistent news story in the whole world for the last 75 years. I mean, there have been a lot of other world-shaking events, and if you ever notice, they start and then they end. Whether we're talking about World War I or World War II, the Korean conflict, Vietnam, Iraq, Iran, and we go through a whole list. And we can even talk about the coronavirus. The one thing we know about even pandemics is they start and one day they end. We hope that they end sooner rather than later, but they eventually go off the scene and we stop talking about them. But what's amazing is Israel and Jerusalem have remained continually in the headlines for the last 75 years. That once the coronavirus is no longer big news, we will begin to hear news reports coming out of the Middle East and the issues between Israel and the rest surrounding Muslim nations. And why is that the case? Well, again, because God said in the last days, he would make Jerusalem an immovable, burdensome, heavy stone for all of the nations that he was the one who was going to keep shifting our attention back to it as the center of what he's doing on the earth. You know, it's amazing when you think about it. Since 1948, when Israel first became a nation, they have been involved in eight separate wars. And importantly, they have prevailed every time because not to prevail meant their literal extinction, not only as a nation, but very possibly their population as a whole. And even though they have been mostly in those eight wars outmatched, outnumbered, out-equipped, out, out, out and in some ways even 
behind the curve in terms of the number and sophistication of military technology, a dynamic that has only really changed most recently, uh, what we happen to do is when we see that they prevail, we always tend to credit that to human capability. We, we wonder, what is it about the Israeli soldier or the way they organize their armies? And it's interesting to me because when I talk to Israelis, they will very jokingly say, we're not that good. We're not that good. They, many of them, recognize there's an unseen hidden hand that somehow keeps on pushing forward and prevailing against their enemies. And the Bible tells us the truth. He says, again in Zechariah, all who try to move it will injure themselves. And so when I look at those nations that surround Israel, those ones like Syria and Lebanon and Egypt and Jordan, who have militated against Israel in the past, all of them are suffering greatly. They're, they're suffering economically, they're suffering culturally, they're, there's all sorts, of, in fact, we call it the Arab Spring, uh, which d turned out to be really a, an Arab winter of hardship and difficulty, of death and destruction. But why is all of that happening? I would suggest to you, because God said, I will put that trouble on you. Remember what he promised to Abraham in Genesis 17? I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. So when the psalmist says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, I think we should take that seriously. It's something that I think brings blessing upon us as well. And I personally have said this many times, and I believe it to be true, that America will be a strong and successful, prosperous country as long as we are faithful to support Israel, because that's what God wants. Not because Israel is always right or always does the right thing, because sometimes they blow it. But the point is that they are God's chosen people and he wants us to support them. Well, the Bible also tells us, though, that there is still one more war, one more conflict that Israel's going to have to face. And it's this ba battle of Gog and Magog that's described in chapter 38 and 39 of Ezekiel. And it's interesting because it tells us essentially that there will be this massive coalition of nations that he describes as Rosh, Magog, Meshach, Tubal, Persia, Cush, Gomer, Beth, Togarma, who are led by an individual called Gog, the, the prince of Rosh, and Meshach, and Tubal. I mean, pretty strange names, but nonetheless, he says there will be this massive coalition that will come together for the very purpose of destroying Israel. In fact, the battlefield that it describes is going to be on the mountains of Israel. The purpose of the invasion, it says, is threefold. One, to plunder. Second, to loot. And thirdly, to destroy the people of Israel. The end result, though, is going to be far different than these armies anticipate. What we'll find is a seemingly overwhelming and invincible army is completely and utterly destroyed. I think the term that Romans used was decimated. Uh, Ezekiel goes on to explain that, that God actually engineers this whole conflict where he says to, to uh, Rosh, I'm going to put, or Gog, excuse me, I'm going to put a hook in your jaw and draw you into this conflict. Basically, God says, I'm going to draw you for two reasons. First of all, he says in Ezekiel 35 and again in 25, because these nations have harbored an ancient hostility. And he goes on to explain, he says, you acted in vengeance and took revenge with malice in their hearts and with ancient hostility sought to destroy Judah. So that God basically says, as you have so committed yourself, you've made it actually a generational hostility towards my people that I will punish you for that hostility. And I can tell you even today that if you were to walk into a Palestinian school today or most Arab schools today, not only would you find maps that don't show Israel on, on, in the present Middle East today, but they speak continuously about destroying, fighting, removing, overcoming, and basically call the Jews all sorts of derogatory names. And the whole point is that they say our objective is to destroy Israel and Israel kick out the surviving Jews out of the country. In fact, they often hold up Adolf Hitler as a hero in human history. 
Well, he secondly tells us the reason it's going to happen. He says, so I will show my greatness and my holiness, and I will make myself known in the sight of many nations, and then they will know that I am the Lord. That is, that the whole world will see me do this, and they'll recognize that I am the one true God. Now, that in itself is fascinating to me because we're going to find that right on the heels of the Gog and Magog, I believe that the Great Tribulation begins. And that it's during the Tribulation, or at least in the middle of it, where what happens? The Antichrist and the devil, Satan, project themselves to the world as being the true God. So basically, people have a very apparent choice. There's a God who, who in his power destroyed Gog and Magog and eliminated their threat something I refer to as the death of Islam, and I'll explain that further on. But secondly, you have the devil who stands up and says, no, I am the true God who should be worshiped. So it's not like people don't have clear evidence for a decision, but they choose the one that satisfies their passions rather than those which would satisfy what they could see obviously with their own eyes. Well, so we're left with these couple of questions to answer. And the first one is not just why, because I've just answered that, but when it will happen, who will be the participants, and what will happen once it transpires. Uh, as to the when the battle takes place, all commentators agree that, at least with one point, it doesn't happen or it hasn't happened as yet that it's something that we're looking to happen in the future. In other words, when we look at the history of Israel, we can never find a single event that lines up with the battle of Gog and Magog. So it's something that's yet to be fulfilled, something that is yet further, which is exactly what he explains. But secondly, the battle of Gog and Magog should not be confused with the Battle of Armageddon. And this happens oftentimes because the Battle of Armageddon takes place at the very end of the tribulation. That battle is ended with the second coming of Christ. But Gog takes place before the tribulation. And I say that because in the text he says that after Gog is destroyed, it will take them seven years to cleanse the land of all the refuse, debris, and human body carnage that takes place when God destroys them. Well, that would be the entire period of the tribulation, and we understand that the tribulation period is not a time in which Israel is able to occupy the land. In fact, Jesus gives the instruction that when the Antichrist puts his image in the temple in the very middle of the tribulation, that Israel is to flee into the wilderness. They're certainly not going to spend the last three and a half years of the tribulation going around and uh, picking up bodily debris around the, around the nation. But secondly, Armageddon takes place in the valley of Megiddo. That's what the word Armageddon literally means. And, and Gog takes place on the mountains of Israel, a different location. And thirdly, Armageddon is between uh, two completely different sets of com uh, combatants as those who face the Antichrist. Uh, or excuse me, face the uh, Israelites. The, the Battle of Armageddon says it's between the army of the Antichrist and the kings of the rising sun, literally referring to what we would often call Asia or the Orient, the Far East. Many people would speculate, just simply because the current geopolitical situation that's referring to the uh, uh, Chai Coms, the Chinese, the Communist Chinese, or Red China today, uh, it's not a bad guess, but we don't know for certain. But when we look at the Battle of Gog and Magog, it's between Israel and a list of countries that we know today are the Muslim crescent that surrounds the nation of Israel. So one is a battle between Islamic nations with Israel. The other one is between the Orient and or Asia and the Antichrist. Now, Ezekiel does give us some further clues to help us identify the when of these events. That first of all, he tells us it's going to happen in the latter days or the end times. He says it will be uh, something that's going to happen prior to the second coming of Christ. But secondly, he said it's going to, Israel in chapter 38, 11 is living in a land of unwalled villages that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls. Now, some people said, well, that certainly doesn't describe Israel today because they're armed to the teeth and they're well protected. But there's a misunderstanding. Other than the 400-mile wall that they have built to separate the West Bank from uh, Israel, 
Uh, Israel live, the Israelis live in unwalled cities. They probably are more powerful and therefore safer than they have been at any time in their history. You know, many people saying, well, what's the danger of Iran, Iran shooting a nuclear bomb at Israel? Well, there's always that threat, but the whole point is that if Iran ever did that, they would be blown into obliteration and, and they would be completely wiped out. And so they have a lot of bluff and bluster, but what they're really trying to do, I believe, is develop the nuclear weapons so they can intimidate the other Muslim countries. They know they wouldn't stand a chance if they went against Israel. The thirdly, it says they will be very prosperous. In fact, it's interesting. It says Sheba and Dedan, which we'll see refers to what we call the Gulf states, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, uh, the Arab Emirates, and so forth, those Gulf countries that are rich in oil. It says, and the mar merchants of Tarshish and all of her villages. It's interesting. Villages is actually translated literally young lions, and we'll talk more about who that could be. But they are going to ask this invading army, have you gathered to loot, to seize much plunder? It's interesting, as I said, that Israel has never had any major resources, and yet today they are one of the most prosperous countries in the world. Uh, and now they have newly discovered reserves of gas and oil that not only have made them energy self-sufficient, but they are able to also sell those ga that gas and oil to other countries, bringing in increasing cash reserves. But there's one other resource that they have that nobody else in the Middle East has, and that is an unlimited supply of water, which is kind of amazing when you think about it because all they have is the Sea of Galilee in order to provide water for much of the nation. The rest relies upon rainwater for the most, and that's, you know, we're talking about maybe 12, 16 inches of rain a year in much of the country. And yet, they have developed a series of uh, desalinization plants that are revolutionary in their design, unlike the coal oil-based ones that pollute. These are run by solar energy, producing clean water, drinking water. So the day, 80% of Israel's water that they take in comes from uh, the Mediterranean Sea. That's always kind of funny because years ago, Arafat, when he was uh, leading the PLO, said that they were going to drive Israel into the Mediterranean, and he says, let them drink salt water. And it's kind of a joke today because that's exactly what they're doing. They're drinking salt water that's been desalinated and meeting most of their needs. They're the only country in the Middle East that has an abundant source of water, which in itself is usually attractive to the other countries around them. But third, fourthly, we find that this is going to happen, as I mentioned before, before the Great Tribulation takes place because of the seven years of removing body and debris from the battlefield. And fifthly, it's going to happen before Israel has its awakened. Remember when I said before, reading in Romans 11, Paul said, in the last days, all Israel will be saved. Well, it's the battle of Gog and Magog that brings that to pass. They will see, as they're overwhelmed by their enemies, God divinely intervening in an unmistakable way, destroying their enemies, and it becomes apparent to everyone that the God of Israel is real, he is powerful, and he's present. In fact, it says, from that day forward, the house of Israel will know that I am their God. They will know that Yahweh is the one true only God. So the second question we need to ask is, who, or, uh, who is composed of these combatants? And that's easier to answer to a degree, although there's still some uncertainty assigned with it. Zechariah said it would involve the surrounding nations. The word sabib in, in, in Hebrew literally means immediately around them. So when we're looking at countries like Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Iran, and Jordan, and, and Egypt, and so forth, we're talking about those nations that uh, are surrounding them. But he divides those nations into two groups. There's, first of all, the non-combatants. Sheba and Dedan, which I mentioned before, are the Persian Gulf states. And then he adds Egypt, 
And it's interesting because all of these nations have a, a working relationship, if not an outright treaty of peace between them and the Israelis. And so it's not surprising that they're listed as being the non-combatants because today they are non-combatants towards Israel. In fact, we know that Saudi Arabia and, and Kuwait and other countries are working very closely with the Israelis to help counterbalance the threat of Iran. But then it goes on and mentions also, secondly, the merchants of Tarshish. Or literal, it's interesting because throughout uh, the books of the Bible, the Old Testament, we find there's reference to what's called the ships of Tarshish. And it simply referred to any ship that traveled a long distance. This could be a metaphor for Europe or even America, the countries which lie in the West. And essentially, that would make sense, at least in our current situation, that Europe and America would condemn any effort to invade the land of Israel. But that brings us to the combatants. Who are actually attacking them? Well, Rosh, Gog, and Magog were, in the times of Ezekiel, the, uh, the northern, p tribes of people that lived in the northern Black Sea area, including people like the Scythians and others of that nature. Uh, they're part of what we call the stands, Kazakhstan, Afghanistan, uh, and so forth. That these are countries that, for the most part, are the southern part of the former Soviet Union. They're independent nations, but they're also Muslim in their orientation and in their religious conjecture. The secondly, he talks about Meshach, Tubal, Gomer, and Beth Togarma. Those are, were in, in Ezekiel's day, Turkey and modern day Lebanon. And then he mentions Persia, which not only includes Iran, but it also would include Iraq and Syria, countries that were under Persian uh, 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 control and, uh, and, uh, and uh, governorship. And then he mentions Cush, which is Ethiopia and Sudan, and Put, which is North Africa, including Libya, Libya Algeria, Morocco, and so forth. And again, the, the point is, what do all of these nations have in common? They're all Islamic nations. And they all share what we would call a virulent hatred of the nation of Israel. You know, see, following the Six-Day War, when Israel took possession of the Temple Mount, uh, the Arab League met in Khartoum, Sudan. And that meeting was uh, attended by eight different Arab countries. There was Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq, Algeria, Kuwait, and Sudan. And by the way, all of those countries had contributed soldiers to the Six-Day War to fight against Israel. And they adopted what has become referred to as the three no's at that meeting. They said no peace, no negotiations, and no recognition of Israel. In other words, a commitment that we will not move one meter in making peace with the nation of Israel. In fact, the reason that Anwar Sadat was, was assassinated was because he made peace with Israel. And the, the Muslim Brotherhood, which took control uh, for a while of Egypt uh, under the auspices of our former president, basically they were the ones responsible for murdering him and they're the ones who are behind uh, the Palestinian revolt in Gaza and so forth. And so this is something, as I mentioned before, it's an ancient hostility. It's become a point of honor in what we call an honor culture. It's hard for us to understand, but the people in, the, in, in Islam, and particularly in the Middle East, believe that Islam is the greatest religion. And, you know, they always say Allah is great, Allah Akbar, whenever they uh, worship or they launch an attack on somebody. And yet, that basically the promise was that if they honored Allah, they would be the power, they would take over the entire world, and they would be the governing caliph over all of mankind. And yet here they have right in the middle of their, we might call their home base, this nation which really mocks them, not intentionally, but by the very success of the Jews, they see themselves being insulted. So the more Israel prospers, the more powerful it becomes, the more they feel resentment and hostility, and it becomes a jihad. Now, jihad in Islam is a requirement that any territory that was once in possession of the Muslims has to be regained. And by the way, which includes places like most of Eastern Europe and also Spain. 
But the idea is that they're going to wage war. Every Muslim is required to wage war until that is accomplished. And the, but there is no greater offense to them in this sense of Israel being present in the middle of the nation. And the more Israel succeeds, the more they become offended. So that what we find that Ezekiel twice again told us this attitude. He said it was an ancient hostility. It's produced in them vengeance, malice, and a constant effort to destroy the Jewish nation. Now, this is where we get to the what happens in this story. And that's, I think, probably one of the interesting parts. Because even though these nations will invo invade with an overwhelming force... Once again, they will fail. This will be at least the ninth time that they will fail in their efforts. And not because Israel shows military superiority, but because God has made a promise to them. All who try to move it, speaking of Jerusalem, will injure themselves. The destruction described by Ezekiel has reminded many of the aftermath of a nuclear explosion. And I'm not implying that Israel is going to drop a nuke on these invading armies. But I would say that basically a nuclear explosion is something that God would have no problem created. I often wonder if the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah wasn't just such an event. All God has to do is split an atom and he can make it happen. But the way it describes in Ezekiel 39, 19, it says, God says, my zeal and fiery wrath... There shall be a great earthquake, which would happen with an explosion, and all the people on the face of the earth will tremble at my presence. It's something that's going to send a shock wave around the world, not necessarily literally, but certainly mentally and emotionally. And he says, the mountains will be overturned, the cliffs will crumble, every wall will fall, and I will pour down torrents of rain, hailstone, and burning sulfur, which again sounds very much like a description of what happens in a nuclear uh, explosion. Again, in, in, in chapter 39, some people have said that this description in verse 14 kind of follows along what the protocol is for troops going into an area that has, has been uh, subjected to a nuclear explosion. He says, at the end of seven months... So they don't even go on to the battlefield for seven months. At the end of seven months, they will make a search. And as those who pass through see a man's bone, then he will set up a marker and buy it until the barriers have buried it. So in other words, if you're traveling through that area, you can't even go into it for seven months. And if you're traveling through it and you see a bone, you put a little flag there, probably like a lawn flag for your sprinkler system, so that when people who are given the task of eliminating the debris and the bodies come into it, they can come and find it and bury it so that it doesn't become uh, dangerous and it's in its exposure to those who come upon it. You know, but I would again emphasize that if this is a nuclear explosion or something like it, not that God is confined to that mechanism, but it's something that's not detonated by man. It's something that's detonated by God. It's the only way that God can get the complete glory for what happens when it's revealed that he alone has done it independently of any human effort. You see, in past messages, I've referred to the death of Islam. In fact, teaching on this very passage, I, I gave it that title. And it elicited some interesting responses off the internet. Uh, there were some people who weren't happy with that title. But basically, what happens is Muslim, the Muslim God, which is Allah, will basically completely discredit it. This will destroy the heart of the Muslim religion and leave it really without any supporters or defenders. And it's at that point when Israel sees how God intervenes and Islam is basically totally discredited that Israel, we're told, will turn back in faith to Yahweh. In fact, it's interesting how Zechariah describes this in Zechariah 12.10. He says, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. And they will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. In other words, it's a brokenness of repentance and sorrow for their sins. I believe that the, Gog, the battle of Gog and Magog is the thing that is a prelude 
to the beginning of the great tribulation or the tribulation period. And what we find in Revelations is that the Jews spend the first three and a half years of the tribulation building the third temple on the Temple Mount. There will no longer be any objection to removing the Dome of Rock and building the temple in its place. There's going to be no outcry from anybody to the leveling and, and removing of all the Muslim structures because it'll be overwhelming that God has intervened and they will build their temple just as it was in the days of, of Solomon and Herod. But they will be assisted apparently in this effort by the Antichrist. At least that's what we find suggested in Daniel chapter 9 where it says that the Antichrist enters into a covenant with Israel for seven years but in the middle of that seven year covenant he breaks it. And so what we find is kind of this joining together, this kind of nexus point in the midst of the tribulation at the three and a half year point where the Jews have finished rebuilding the temple and begun the process of restoring the traditional historical worship outlined in the book of Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy and Leviticus. And as they're beginning to enter into this worship, the Antichrist takes his image and places it in the holiest of holies and he declares that Satan is God and he is the Messiah, the Son of God. And this is what Jesus described as the abomination that makes desolation. And at that point in Matthew 24, Jesus said, you who are in Jerusalem, flee to the mountains. Get out of Jerusalem as fast as you can. And so the Jews really have to go into exile. And we have a lot of speculation as to what exactly that's going to look like. None of us probably will know exactly until that day actually transpires. But it's interesting because, you know, again, Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2 that uh, the lawless one, the Antichrist, would set himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God, which again is the abomination of desolation spoken of by Jesus and also by Daniel. But in Revelation 13, 14, he says that the Antichrist deceived the inhabitants of the earth and ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast and all who refused to worship the image to be killed. And he also forced everyone to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark. In other words, the mark becomes primarily a symbol of submission and worship to Satan and to the Antichrist. Now, next week I want to come to the last installment of this series, number 10, and I want to talk about the rapture of the church. And uh, where does it fit into the story? There are different theories, different opinions. I'm going to share with you mine as well as try to represent the other views. But it's an important aspect because one of the things, again, that John said to us is this hope of Christ's coming is what purifies us. Paul to the Titus, it is the blessed hope, the thing that's most important to us. In a time when we're finding a lot of bad news everywhere around us, this is the good news that we as Christians uh, look forward to. It's the hastening towards the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the question we'll be talking about is, are you rapture ready? Is that day going to catch you off guard and by surprise? So I look forward to continuing this conversation next week and thank you for spending your valuable time with us today. Well, again, for all of you watching, uh, these questions are available. Uh, there's a link to them in the comments section or in the description as well. And so you can find those, discuss them with your family or community members as you're able to, but really wanna encourage you as we're not again able to actually have a time of response with uh, our own communion here, you can do that in your home. We want to encourage you to do that or seek prayer with other people. If God's spoken to you a very specific word, uh, make sure that you, you act on that. Make sure you respond to his voice as obedience is so important. But uh, as we get started here, um, as you were speaking, Ken, kind of uh, throw a wild card on you because I was thinking, because <laughs> as I was looking over these questions, this is one of those topics that as you look online, I mean, you can find all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. You can find some people, as you've mentioned, a lot of even pastors just don't even care about this subject. And you can find people who just, I mean, they've got everything dialed in and they've written books and it sounds more like a, a sci-fi movie than something that could actually happen. But I got to thinking, you know, some people, I think not just pastors, but some people just don't really dig into this stuff just because it's like, I can't get, I can't understand that. Everything, you spend a whole week, you spent years and years and years studying this. But I just want to kind of put it out there for people who are watching 
Uh, if people want to try to get a grasp on this, something that's not going to go too far deep in to say like this means this and this means this, because obviously a lot of this is pure speculation. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot is um, you, you've detailed out some very specific things, but a lot of it is just we just don't know. Yeah. And so are there any, any resources or ways that you would encourage people to, to kind of dip your toe in that water and start to like, it's important that we, that we figure out, I mean, this is going to happen. And so we would be wise to, to be aware of it. Well, I, I would strongly suggest that they listen to all of my tapes on this subject. <laughs> um, I'm afraid that uh, I, right off the top of my head, I can't recommend any one particular author or book uh, simply because I don't ever read those anymore. Mm. And, and for the very reason you stated, that you get a lot of uh, different ideas and, and a lot of speculations. And we shouldn't assume that speculation is wrong, mm. but I think that, you know, when we look at something and somebody states, well, it could possibly this and be possibly that, well, to, in terms of something being logic possible, yeah, there's all sorts of possibilities. But what is logically possible? And that's where when you study this topic, you try to, at least what I try to do is try to find out what are the, the parameters in which the scriptures define this event and how do I make all those various parts fit together? And it, it is a very difficult thing. And I don't uh, put my views out there as if they are the final word um, because I'm like everybody else. I'm growing and my understanding changes. And I think one of the problems we've had historically with people trying to understand end times prophecy is they look at the world around them at that moment in time and then try to interpret it within that context. Uh, I often joke, joke about a, a book that was uh, uh, real popular when I first got saved called uh, 666 and written by a gentleman by the name of Salem Kirban. And he, was he attempted to do that. In fact, when I talked about the beast coming out of the bottomless pit, which had long hair and, and breastplates of iron and, and you know, so forth, he concluded that that was the Beatles. Because they had long hair, <laughs> the breastplates for the electric guitars. It makes and sense I, to me. <laughs> I remember even at the time I thought, really? Uh, because I realized, he's, he, again, he was basically allegorizing the whole idea of what was taking place. I think that's always a problem. And I, I admit that what I do is I look at what's going on in the world around me and see how does it line up with what the Bible says. And I put them out there as things, a possibilities that I encourage people to consider and reflect upon. But uh, there was one other time I was wrong, and so this could be the <laughs> second time, right? Well, I think that's the other thing about just this time, I guess, in history, is that you use that word possibility. And from what I've seen just when what I'm looking online or in different books and things is, is possibility doesn't mean the same thing as, as you say. You're mm -hmm. saying, oh, just here's something to think about. But what I've found is that when people say that something's possible, it's so much more than that. They hold that view deep in their heart and it actually is affecting how they live. And so yeah. they're making their decisions. They're saying what they're saying or not saying what they're saying based on that. It's not just a possibility for them. Yeah. Well, that's why I think that theology is never something that should be studied in isolation. And that's where I find that some of the most, uh, what I would call bizarre concepts come from people who really don't talk to anybody else but themselves. They, right. Or if they have a group, they're, they're a group of people that are fairly sycophantic and supporting of whatever they come up with. And I think that uh, in one sense, none of us like the idea of being challenged in what we're saying. But there is, as, as Proverbs says, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. And... Uh, I read those views, many of them that are put out there, and I've read different books on it and got and, and try to take in and see how it works. At the end of the day, there is no perfect explanation because the perfect hasn't yet come. When Jesus comes, everything will make complete sense. But more importantly to me is the fact that we are watching. We are watching. We're looking at the world around us. We're looking at the Word of God, and we're trying to say, Lord, what are going to be those signs of his coming? And, you know, again, I've stated my opinion, my personal point of view, that I, I can't, I don't believe there's been another time in human history where we have had more evidence to point us to, or at least more signs pointing us to the end times than what we have in the world today. Does that mean that I know when Christ's going to return? No. Uh, do I even know that it's going to happen within my, my lifetime? My pastor lived his entire life believing with all of his heart that he was going to see the coming of Christ, and he's passed on now, and it didn't happen in his lifetime. And I, I know that was a personal disappointment for him, but I don't know how long he was disappointed because once he passed away, 
he was in the presence of the Lord and he didn't have anything else to worry about from anymore. But the whole point is that uh, these aren't things that we go to battle over each other. These aren't right. central issues. What is, I think, central is that we believe that Christ is going to return and that we must believe on him in order to be saved. Uh, the other issues, you, you can hold your opinions. We can disagree. Um, I can just say that from where I'm sitting, I'm really trying my best to give the most accurate uh, representation of what I think the scriptures foretell. Yeah. Well, again, if you're watching this, that question is not on the sheet, um, but <laughs> we'll, we'll get back on, to, on, on track here. Uh, the first one is, and you, you kind of explain this in your message, but, but why do you think that Israel or Jerusalem and the Jews are continuously in the headlines? I mean, I was thinking about when I saw that question, and, and it's, it's so true. No matter what else yeah. is going on, they're still there. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing that I, I, it just occurred to me one day that uh, we have all sorts of events that come and go. And, you know, once World War II ended, it was over. There was the aftermath, the consequences, and we carry a historic memory of it. But the reality is that we're not still fighting the war. Mm -hmm. And, but when we look at Israel, it just never changes. It just, it continues on, it continues on, and continues on. And it doesn't make any sense. At some point, somebody should prevail and all of this should come to an end. Because even to, to most degrees, uh, Ireland has pretty much stopped killing each other. You know, I mean, even though there's still hostility and little conflicts once in a while, but essentially people just get tired and they embrace and, and go on. Uh, but uh, not in the Middle East. They're farther away from each other than they've ever been in their entire history. And I, I think, you know, not only is it the factor that God has said that this is going to be ground zero for the end times, but also there's that, what I talked about, that intractable aspect of uh, Islamic faith. You know, when Yasser Arafat was the head of the PLO, he was a communist, basically. He, he was a socialist communist. He wasn't a religious man. He was a political man. And, but something happened when, uh, when the Iranian Revolution took place. There was this kind of resurgence of uh, faith in Islam, a, a throwing off of the yoke of all these secular Arab leaders and going back to a religious faith. And what happened throughout the Middle East was the spiritual leaders were teaching their people that the reason we are an oppressed people is because we haven't honored Allah. And if we're more devoted to Allah, we will rise up and we will drive out the Israelis and we'll overtake the world. And both the little Satan, which is Israel, and the great Satan will be destroyed. And that's why 9-11 was so significant to them. They see that as a marker point, as the beginning of bringing the great Satan down. All of that feeds into a mindset that is militant and committed to this objective of jihad and the destruction of all the uh, secular forces that they see around them. And so you begin to see it even early on, it began to change very quickly that uh, today now all the Muslim leaders, I mean, remember Saddam Hussein was appealing to the Muslim faith to come against, and he was a godless man if there ever was one and the same thing is true all over the the middle east there's more and more of an appeal to being faithful to allah and to present whatever they're doing is for the sake of islam and uh if we so that whereas there used to be no more than five um uh bedouin uh mosques in israel uh today there are hundreds hmm. In other words, even the Bedouins who are kind of quasi-religious have now become much more devoted and much more zealous. And we see that zealotry rising up in all sorts of places, creating all sorts of problems. And so there is a, that overriding spiritual dimension that God says this is going to be ground zero. But there's also uh, sociological and geopolitical reasons why it's going on. That it, it, geopolitically, it serves the purpose of many of these Muslim leaders to make it into some kind of religious crusade. Uh, rallying the troops around them, if you will, but also for the common man, it lifts his sense of being an oppressed person into being someone who can control his destiny and can change the dynamics of his world. And the idea that if I happen to succeed in murdering a, a, a Jew, uh, that I will go immediately to heaven and have 72 dark-eyed virgins who will attend to me until all of eternity, which is interesting because that's not even a teaching in the Quran. That's another teaching that came in later on. So, uh, again, by somebody who probably wanted to get young men to go out and kill themselves for the cause. 
So that's what I think about that. <laughs> no, I think it's uh, one of those things. I just remember as you were talking, I remember being in even middle school, you know, where they had still had the TVs in the corner and we watched the news every morning and there was different characters, but I guess if I could say the teams were the same, like yeah. everything. So different, you guys have grown up, seen different people in office, but the conflict of back and forth and, you know, almost fighting like, you know, brothers and sisters is just yeah. like going on and on and on and on. And well, I think too, even it's... Um, it's even kind of prevalent or kind of interesting to me to think that even in our country, every time we have a new leader up for it's kind of cool, what's your stance on this? And there's, there's, there's a very dividing line about what do you do with them? Are, are you for them or are you against them? Yeah. Well, I go back to when uh, uh, the, the Russian uh, ambassador to Washington uh, confronted Harry Truman and simply asked him, why are you supporting the Israels, Israelis against as opposed to the, uh, the Arab nations? And his answer was short and curt. He said, because it's right. Mm. And that concept that this is the right thing to do. One of the things about we have, you know, as, as a country, as a nation, we have certainly our falli- fallibilities and, and our mistakes. And we have things in our history that we uh, certainly are sorry about and wish it had never been part of it. But nonetheless, overall, when you look at America, it's the only country in the history of the world that has dedicated itself to uplifting everybody else. And that's part of why we got involved with Israel was to help uplift them up because they were at the time clearly the most persecuted and hated people on the planet uh, and had suffered more losses through World War II than any other people. But even beyond that, um, the sense that this was the right thing to do. And I think that, again, I would just say for America to, to maintain its strength and security in the world is to never fail to be there to back up Israel. I, I just think that the amazing economic upturn that we saw at, shortly after President Trump came to office came, I believe, right on the heels. In fact, if you look at a calendar, you'll find that it was right on the heels of him recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Now, that had been done by several presidents, President Bush, the first one, President Clinton, President Bush, the second one, they had all said that they recognized Jerusalem and one day we will put our embassy there, but they would never put it there until Trump did. And I think that was critically important because what it was is a definitive moment where it just basically said, we're going to stop pretending like Jerusalem is up for discussion. The Israelis were never going to give it up and the Palestinians would never accept it, but they're now they're forced to accept it. But it really is kind of like simply saying to them, either fish, cut bait or get out of the boat. <laughs> but let's, if you really want peace, we'll have peace, but this is never going to change. Yeah, I think uh, the interesting thing about that is I think is once something is always there, you talk about them being in the news or them being prevalent all the time, you, you stop noticing it. And it's yeah. not until you actually start thinking about it, like, no, they actually, they actually are there. And uh, according to God, according to the Bible, they always will be there. Yeah. And so, uh, so kind of moving on to kind of the why, the second question you had here is, is does it seem, and I lo- love the way you worded this, does it seem fair or right to you, <laughs> as if that matters, but, <laughs> but does it seem fair or right to you that Israel is, is the apple of God's eye is what he refers to them as, and what, do you, what exactly do you think that that means? Yeah, I think that what it means primarily is God says, I'm going to focus upon them in terms of being the tool that I'm going to use to fulfill my purpose. In other words, we recognize that any craftsman looks at a job and he decides what's the best tool that I can use to accomplish this. And for reasons that completely escape me, he looked at the Jewish people and said, you are the tool. In fact, it began with Abraham and his descendants after him. God said, this is the tool that I'm going to use to accomplish my purposes in the world. And from the very beginning, when God formed them into a nation and Moses led them out of Egypt, God told them in Deuteronomy, I have chosen you not for any of those kind of things that we often attribute success to. It's not because you're stronger, you're smarter, you're better, or anything like that. It's because I have chosen to love you. So at the end of the day, when we begin to give reasons why God loves certain people or favors certain people, we really put ourselves in a whole different crosshair that we don't want to be in. Because I don't want to live in a world that's, that's totally fair, totally just, because if that was the case, I would be burning at a stake someplace right now. <laughs> I mean, because we've all been guilty of of thoughts and deeds and words that if we were got our just deserves we would uh we would be punished severely 
But we often talk about how we want mercy. And that's why I think it's always funny because before I was saved, I would look at people and I wanted mercy for me and justice for everybody else. <laughs> now I just realize that God has shown me mercy and I have an obligation to show that mercy as well. So using terms like fair and just in terms of God's choices is almost so presumptuous in the sense that we could even determine what is fair or just that God is the only one who ultimately can say whether the thing is fair or just. And so he doesn't have that argument with us or even allow us to have the argument. He just simply says, this is what I have done and this is why I'm going to do it. You can submit to that and be blessed or you can fight against it and, be, and suffer. Yeah, I love the way that you responded. You, you got a question like that a while back ago and your response was just kind of like, well, you had to choose somebody. <laughs> and I think uh, if we're honest with ourselves, I think unless it's us, we probably have a, play with, a problem with it or think like, well, that isn't fair. Well, I look at the history of Israel and I'm glad he didn't pick me. <laughs> yeah, it's not, all, it's not all it's cracked up to be, I guess, at all times. But I, one thing that I, I saw when I was looking at just this, this concept, this, the apple of, of the eye, and that's not a term that we typically use now, Right. but there's so much there. Um, so many things from um, that just being the, the most vulnerable part and the fact that it just lines up with the fact, even just as you were talking today, um, it's not because they're, they're so big. And even from the very beginning, yeah. you know, God told his people that it's not because you're so big or you're so great. In yeah. fact, it's actually the opposite. Yeah. No, in, in, the, in the world of Israel, the, your eyes were the most important thing. One of the worst things that could happen to you was to be blind. I mean, they, they didn't have, you know, laws that protected disabled people in those days. And you became literally a beggar. That's all that was left open to you. To protect your eye was the most important thing that you could do. You could lose a hand and still function. You lose your eyes and you're out of business. And so when God uses that, it's a really a Hebraism, we say. It's a Hebrew colloquialism. But the idea behind it is, this is the thing that I protect above and beyond everything else. And so when God says, my eye is upon them continually, and they are the of my eye, it's that overemphasis of the fact that don't miss this point, that I am following them closely, my hand is upon them, and uh, it's, it's something I think that we need to understand, because as we come into Christ, when Paul talks about how that we have been born into the family of God, we who are strangers and aliens now have become that middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile, the thing that separated us both from God that veil that hung between the holy place and the most holy place, the holy of holies, and that veil was torn open. He says, and that veil of separation has been removed, and together Jew and Gentiles can go boldly into the throne of grace and worship God through his son, Jesus Christ. Um, that puts me in that most favored category, that I am the owl of the apple of his eye just as well, and that's what happens when we come to Christ. He becomes the protector of that which is most precious to him. Amen. Well, the last question, you kind of, you touched on a little bit when I, when I threw you off, but uh, close with it. Says, what is your understanding of the term last times? Uh, do you see other events that suggest to you that we are living in those times? And obviously, you said many times before, yeah, we are, but yeah. people are, people will want, you know, more answers. They want like, no, really, like, is it going <laughs> to? Yeah. Well, I think, first of all, there's an important, just a distinction in terminology, because when we talk about the last times or the latter days, it's translated various different ways in, in many English versions, but it, it refers to, again, a season, a period of time, the, the last epoch or the last era that, uh, that we talk of the times of the Gentiles, that was a, a time, but now this, these are the latter times, the end times. Um, but more specifically, when we talk about the end, the time of the end, it really defines it from the moment that Christ returns and sets up his kingdom on the earth. At that moment, the end comes. That's when God says, no more. In fact, if we look at uh, Matthew 24, the moment the Antichrist puts his image in the temple, that's when he says, then the end will come. That's going to be the definitive line. And that's why we call the second half of the tribulation, the great tribulation. Because that's when the seven uh, plagues are poured out upon the earth. And as terrible as the previous three years are going to be with their problems, nothing compared to what's going to happen at the, in those last three and a half years. And that is ultimately the end. And yet, one of the things that we see in Revelation, it says that as these plagues are coming, there are angels flying through heaven declaring the everlasting gospel. So God's intent and desire from beginning to end is to bring men into the kingdom, to 
save souls by believing on his son. And I think it's so important because as I mentioned in the message, what we have here at the Battle of Gog and Magog is God clearly declaring to all the world, I am the true God. And on the heels of that, Satan, the imposter, comes in and says, oh, no, that's me. That's me. And it's interesting how he tries to always synchronize uh, false worship with true worship. This is why I think I, what I refer to today is what I call woke Christianity. There's kind of this woke Christianity, you know. We, we have to be really woke in our attitudes towards all these things. I don't know if somebody else has come up with that, but first time I heard it was when I came up with it. So I'm taking it. I'm owning it. Anyway, <laughs> that'll be on my tombstone. But um, the author of woke Christianity. Anyway, but it's this this idea that what he tries to do is steal what God did and say, no, that wasn't God, that was me. I was the one. And he does that by wedding himself in alliance with Israel and with the Jewish people, helping them build their temple and then usurping the place of worship. The true believer is going to see that. The true Jew is going to see that and he's going to get out of town. But others are going to simply say, hey, I don't care, it pays you know, it's a job, <laughs> it's a career, it's, it's a pleasure path. And that's what I find as I, as I look at these things and I contemplate these, it, it makes sense to me. Now, can I prove without a doubt that that's exactly what's going to happen? No. But I really, it makes real sense to me. I, I, just, I just, knowing the way that the enemy works and the way God gives the opportunity for people to believe and how the imposter, the counterfeit, the masquerader is always trying to sell himself as being who God is. That's what he did to Jesus you know, in the wilderness when he tempted him and said, worship me. Well, if Jesus were to worship Satan, he would be saying Satan is God and that God is not God. You know? So it's, um, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, something you just said, actually, I just read something this morning. It was just talking about how this idea of pragmatism has not, not only come in and infiltrated, but is starting to take control of the church. And that idea of you saying, like, well, it's a job, you know, we could very easily turn things into what well, it works mm -hmm. and, and lose sight of, like, that's totally not what the Bible says. That's totally not what it... So it's not about just because it works doesn't give us a justification yeah. uh, for doing it. But I think the other thing is, you know, when you talk about end times, really, I think depending... I guess this is probably more relatable to people who either grew up in the church or maybe they've been following Christ or studying their Bible or been in church for many, many years. And they get so focused on the end times and focusing if now we are, um, if we're there or not, or how close are we, or basically kind of, as you talked about, we're just going to hold on because we know it's going to happen in our lifetime, which I'm not sure how we know it's going to happen in our lifetime. I didn't figure that out. <laughs> but but it's all, we, we lose sight or the focus of, of the part in Revelation that says, occupy till I come. Mm -hmm. and, and so easy for us to just become kind of irrelevant in yeah. what we're doing here because we're just holding on. And one thing that uh, I, I read a while ago, and it's just been mulling over in my mind, just this idea as we go through this, this time of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and I was just talking about how as our constraints or as our borders or as the area around us gets smaller and smaller and smaller, you know, in that sense of like, you know, sports, you know, a whole generation of husbands is not going to know what to do because, you know, <laughs> every single sports league has been taken away. But all of these different things, you know, restaurants are closing and things like that. They're limiting the groups of people that can be together. But as those, the boundary becomes smaller and smaller, that's what produces fear. That's what produces, you know, panic in people. But they really pointed this out that it's also the opportunity for something brand new to be birthed in that moment. Yeah. And I think that we found that, I mean, even, even this, there's no reason why we couldn't have done something like this before. Right. But it never even really became an idea or a thought until we couldn't do what we were so used to doing every single Sunday, just planning out services normally and doing things. And I've just seen, as I've looked around, not only our church, but churches in the city, churches around the country, um, this time is really forcing us to, mm -hmm. to do something different. God is still building the church, but it's just looking different. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting how things like we viewed virtual communication and, and presence as being a bad thing, and yet it is proving to be a very 
powerful way for Christians to connect in a very real way. I mean, my wife and I spend more time FaceTiming our family and friends than we ever did before. And it's, it's kind of like, it's interesting because we're talking about more significant things as well. And we're able to minister to one another in ways that we never had the necessity to. And I, I think that's really uh, interesting because God doesn't ever let anything happen except for a greater purpose. For decades, we have been talking about what would we do if the day comes where the government forbids us to worship what what would be our response and it's interesting now it's happened <laughs> yeah i think the interesting thing is i think i mean except churches all over are are learning new ways to do things and i, I think the interesting thing is is what's going to happen after we're not forced to you yeah. know are we gonna are these going to be new things that we have have been challenged to think in a different way or are we going to just be tempted to go back to the way things were and get back into our own yeah. Um, a way of doing things. But um, it's, it's been exciting. Yeah. Really, it has. It's been challenging for a lot of people, and I know a lot of people watching this are, are facing struggles, and, and we're praying for you. Uh, we want to hear from you. And, um, but I think just that idea of, of end times, I guess kind of in closing, is everyone you know, has an opinion of what this all means and what it's not. But I think the one thing that we can all agree on is it's, it's a wake-up call you know, to what is, yeah. what's really important. You know, the things that we think we valued is so important are taken away from us. It changes us. We're all forced to do different things. And I think that, uh, you know, the thing is how we respond today really is shapes, you yeah. know, who we're going to become or, or what we're going to do tomorrow and, and so on. And so, uh, as always, thanks again so much for your preparation and, and sharing with us this morning and sharing insight. Why don't we close with prayer? Absolutely. Father God, we are thankful for your word. That's why we study it. We believe it is the word of life. We believe it's the word of truth. We believe, Lord, that you will guide us into all things that are true, and you'll help us to escape falsehood and deception. And, and I just pray, Lord, that uh, those who have followed this message today would, in our conversation, would be challenged and excited to look up these things and to read these chapters that we've gone through today and see for themselves what they see and hear. But most importantly, Lord, you said to redeem the time and help us to take advantage of the, uh, really the displacement that this time is creating in many of our lives, that we're having to adjust all of our time and our schedule, that we might not let that opportunity escape us, Lord, not to see it as a thing that has robbed us, but rather realizing it has opened up new opportunities. I pray, Lord, that we would be faithful to take advantage of those opportunities while they're before us. I pray, God, that you would deliver us from this pandemic. I pray that you'd give our leaders wisdom and good judgment. And, and uh, I thank you, Lord, that they can put aside the partisanship for a short time. And I pray, God, that, uh, that we would see the best part of our, our nation come out during this time and be able to leave behind a lot of the vitriol we've had to suffer through the last three or four years. And I pray, God, that you would bring healing to those who are suffering. I pray that you bring economic relief to those who are struggling. Uh, I pray that you bring companionship to many who are isolated and alone. Um, and I, I just pray, Lord, that you'd be merciful uh, to us as your people and that we would find, that our scientists would find solutions, Lord, both of cures and treatments and, and vaccinations for this virus. We thank you for it, and we believe you for these things. That's why we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.